Markets have barely flinched upon the Israel-Hamas war. This central bank advisor explains what would need to escalate to move bond, commodity and equity markets significantly. The principal risk is that this gets wider. To date, this isn't 1967, it's not 1973, it's, uh, it's more muted than that, but the potential is there for it to get worse. So the, the initial market reaction was to pre-position for a worsening in conditions. It's Monday the 16th of October and you're watching Markets with Madison. The events of the past week have been horrifying, and firstly, my thoughts are with anyone affected. That shock, though, somehow hasn't extended to markets. Oil initially jumped, but has since come off, and equity markets have actually been rallying. Why is it so muted? And is the market underestimating the longer-term impact this could have on inflation and geopolitical risk? Sean Keane is an advisor to central banks around the world. He's lived in eight countries, one of which is Israel. Sean, thanks so much for joining us. Nice to be here. Thanks, Madison. Let's start with the fixed income market, given you are an expert in this field, Sean. Some of the froth has clearly come off those higher, long-dated yields. It looks like some investors are trying to find safety in bonds, but is that not at odds with this higher for longer argument? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of forces that are really driving market movements right now. One of them is what's been going on in the Middle East um, over the weekend and then into Monday, Tuesday. But there's a broader backdrop of some changes in Fed commentary. I'm, I'm happy to talk about both of those things if that's of interest. Yeah, I would love to know how the market is assessing both of those. It seems like the Fed is more important than geopolitical risks right now. Yeah, and I think that was the question that market certainly had on Monday morning. So when we opened on Monday morning, um, what you usually see in response to military conflict in the Middle East is a flight to safety. And a flight to safety sees people buy U.S. Treasuries principally. Uh, they buy the currencies of uh, the United States and current account surplus countries like Japan and Switzerland. Uh, they sell riskier assets, so equities usually fall. Gold prices usually go up and oil, of course, always goes up. And we saw a little bit of all of that on Monday, but people were hesitant to continue with it because it wasn't clear how far this conflict was likely to go. So to date, this isn't 1967, it's not 1973, it's, uh, it's more muted than that, but the potential is there for it to get worse. So the, the initial market reaction was to pre-position for a worsening in conditions but not to go all the way. Now, over the top of all that came the Fed commentary, which from Friday onwards started to pivot towards a much more, um, a much less hawkish, more considered view of what they will likely need to do with interest rates going forward. And that's because of the large correction upward in long-term interest rates that we've seen over the past month. And so with the Fed changing its, uh, its commentary and its tone, that outweighed for the market, uh, the concerns it had about the Middle East. I do want to ask you in more detail about what could cause a worsening and how that market impact would look. But for now, do you think that the market has priced this geopolitical risk correctly? Um, it, it's difficult to know because these things are, um, you know, when something blows up quickly in a, in a geopolitical sense, you know, markets react very fast. So we had something that so it took place over the weekend. Markets reacted with the information they had available on Monday morning and they stop and wait to see. What they're waiting to see is what happens next. And the risks that you just talked about there, the principal risk is that this gets wider. So at the moment, it's, a, um, it's an Israel-Gaza issue. It's it's fairly local. It's fairly contained. There's been a little bit of noise on the northern border with Lebanon, with Hezbollah. Uh, if that starts to get more uh, hotter, if it gets hotter, if it gets more uh, dangerous, then that will start to bring in Iran. If Iran are involved, then potentially you've got a much bigger issue where you bring in all of the border states. So Syria gets involved, Egypt potentially gets involved. Saudi Arabia will find it very difficult uh, to continue with the opening path that they've had towards Israel, a much more um, uh, amenable perspective that they've had towards the Israeli state, that will be difficult for them to maintain. So if those things uh, happen, then you'll see the market reprice that risk because it will affect oil prices more directly. If you could put a likelihood on an escalation, where would you place it? 
Uh, it, I mean, who knows? It's impossible for anybody to really know. But what I have observed is that the commentary coming out of the United States is deliberately playing down the involvement of Iran. That's incredibly important. So early on, the Wall Street Journal reported that Iran was behind this. That caused an immediate market reaction. Since then, the White House seems to be at pains to say there's no evidence that Iran are behind this. Now, if there were, it would probably be likely that Hezbollah out of Lebanon would be much more active, and they're not. So we'll see. We've heard from the likes of Paul Tudor-Jones, who says that he thinks this is the most threatening geopolitical environment that he's ever seen. The US is obviously getting involved pretty heavily. It's already helping Ukraine against Russia. What does this all mean for geopolitical risk for investors more broadly? Yeah, I mean, we've been through, uh, in my opinion, we've been through more heightened periods of geopolitical risk than the one we're at now. I think the real issue is that the United States is probably less well positioned to deal with these multiple issues that it's currently contemplating. And that's principally because of its indebtedness and its recent um, inconsistencies, I would use the word inconsistency about its policy, um, its foreign policy in particular, towards certain parts of the world like the Far East. Um, in the case of what's happening right now, there's real risk that uh, the United States loses mm -hmm. its way. So they've worked really hard to bring Saudi Arabia closer to Israel, and that's in response to China getting more, more directly involved in negotiating some uh, treaties and peace terms and better trade agreements. So the United States policy has been very much centered around Saudi Arabia. Uh, with what's happening right now, this makes it very difficult for the Saudis to continue with that policy because you end up with an Arab nation potentially siding with a Jewish nation against the Palestinian people who are, of course, Arabs themselves. So the beneficiaries, if you like, rather than, than, than who gets hurt out of this, you know, the beneficiaries are clearly Iran. Iran, uh, Iran benefits from this because it weakens the position of its great rival, Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Russians are beneficiaries indirectly in that the, the attention of the United States is taken away from Ukraine and it will go much more towards Israel. I mean, I don't think it's unreasonable to say that uh, Capitol Hill cares a lot more about what happens in Tel Aviv than they do in Taipei. So you'll see more, more munitions, more, more um, armaments, more focus on what's going on in Israel than you will in Ukraine. And then the third one is China. Uh, China certainly got concerns about its oil supply out of the Middle East, but it's doing pretty well in its oil supplies from Russia, despite the sanctions. So it's got some uh, surety there. But anything, again, that diverts the attention of the United States away from Taiwan and the Far East is helpful for China. So there are winners and losers on this. But the, I think the point that Tudor Jones is making is really that it's the ability of the United States to deal with these challenges is probably the greatest it's ever been, or the greatest challenge it's ever been. Yeah, how would you describe the fiscal position of the US right now, given that it is spending so much on military aid? Yeah, I mean, this can't go on. They're spending like it's a wartime economy, which you know, perhaps it will be. Um, but at the moment, their deficit is rising at about a trillion dollars a year, which is a number that's even hard to get your head around. So we've gone through $33.5 trillion of federal of government debt now in the United States. A decade ago, that was around 23. So we're going pretty quickly, and uh, we've never seen anything like this. This year's fiscal deficit is up around $1.8 trillion. Now, there's no reason or no appetite in the United States to stop that. The Democrats don't want to stop it because Biden wants to get re-elected next year. The Republicans, well, there's part of them that want to stop that. You've, you've seen the recent uh, political turmoil there for the turfing out of the, the Speaker. But for many uh, Republican states, they're beneficiaries of this spending. So their senators and congressmen aren't going to rush to reduce government spending when they're actually the beneficiaries. So this likely continues, at least until the election. How do you think central banks, not only the Fed, but around the world, will be assessing this risk? Yeah, um, for central banks, it's, uh, it's, yeah, they're doing the opposite of what they want them to do. So yeah, the, the fiscal authority is pushing money into the economy and the central banks are trying to restrain the velocity of that money. And that's, that's been the case all over the world. In New Zealand, you know, our central bank here has made pretty clear the fact that they need to get interest rates up to slow consumption, to slow demand, because of the amount of money that went into the economy after COVID. It's been the same all over the world. Now, there are some good things that come out of this. 
One of them is that we are now a long way away from the zero lower bound, which was incredibly distortionary in terms of interest rates. So we look much more normal. The other good thing, in my view, is that um, hopefully we've moved away from this period of total reliance on central banks as the drivers of economic activity. The fiscal authority basically outsourced responsibility for economic management to the central banks over the last 25 years. And we got to the stage where every time there was a slowdown, the fiscal authority looked to the central bank to provide stimulus and do something. And eventually we ran out of runway. And in some places we went negative. You know, much of the world went negative interest rates. That's highly distortionary. What should have happened is that the fiscal authority took a greater role on the way down. Well, they've certainly done that now. They probably need to step back and allow some sort of equilibrium to be reestablished at a higher level. But this is actually a better mix, in my view. Even though it could deteriorate the macro pretty significantly? Uh, well, the macro is something that will get worked out over time between these two. And you know, the macro uh, forces are much greater than just monetary policy or even fiscal. You know, demographics, for one thing, global trade, global relations, all of those things have a big impact on it. You know, This is the post-COVID uh, period where we try and re-equalise uh, or find some sort of equilibrium as to where the economy should be and how, how fast growth, employment and inflation should be. And perhaps try to find some certainty amid all of the uncertainty. I mean, if you could look anywhere for it, where would you go? I mean, I think generally where you want to be is in markets that are growing. And the easiest markets to find in terms of growth are those with population growth. So it's been so difficult for the Japanese and the Europeans to get growth without population growth. Uh, for many years, whereas the younger economies like Australia and New Zealand and the traditionally fast-growing economies like the United States with its large population growth, you've had high correlations between population and GDP. Um, you know, interestingly, Japan now is looking a lot better despite its negative population growth, but that's because I think uh, local assets have been underpriced for a long time, so they're starting to turn around. So Japan looks more interesting for once. Uh, but generally, I'd stay with anything with a strong population base, Australia in particular. Thank you so much for your time, Sean. Your insights are exceptional, as always. Thank you, Madison. Good talking to you. Sean actually taught me one of the best lessons in trying to make sense of markets. He said, Maddie, all they are is fear and greed. That's it. Now go put your money to work. Thanks for watching Markets with Madison, the New Zealand Herald show for interested investors. If you want to stay up to date with financial markets, click the subscribe button below and you can watch our other episodes here. Stay up to date with all the business news and numbers as they land on nzherald.co.nz.